So, in the final scene of Star Wars, The Force Awakens, no, just kidding, just kidding. Don't run for the doors, don't run for the doors. I promise this will be spoiler free. It's a Shabbat of no spoilers. There's gonna be no Star Wars in this drosh at all. Uh, we will wait a very long time. Uh, instead, I want to focus on the Broadway musical Hamilton. <laughs> I, I do. Um, I want to focus on a character trait that lies at the center of this musical and the story of America's founding father, Alexander Hamilton, because it's also a character trait that lies at the center of the story of our patriarch, Jacob. Both Jacob and Hamilton are characters whose lives are driven by feeling like they never have enough, never have achieved enough. In fact, throughout the musical Hamilton, multiple characters reflecting on Alexander's drive and ambition sing, he will never be satisfied. But throughout the musical, Hamilton's wife, Eliza, pleads with him to find satisfaction. She sings to him, look at where you are. Look at where you started. The fact that you're alive is a miracle. Just stay alive. That would be enough. And this becomes a refrain of hers, whose lines will alter and change, but each and every time that phrase ends, that would be enough. For example, after the Revolutionary War, Hamilton is trying to get Congress to pass his banking credit bill, and Eliza sings to him, if I could grant you peace of mind, that would be enough. But nothing is ever enough. And so he makes terrible sacrifices. He sacrifices friendships, time with the people he loves, he sacrifices his reputation, and even his relationships with his family, all in order to continue to succeed and to make a mark on the world around him. Hamilton feels that history has its eyes on him, and nothing will hold him from taking his place in it. In his words, I will not throw away my shot. And Jacob is a similar soul, for whom nothing was ever enough. He was willing to coerce his brother into giving up his birthright. He took advantage of his father's infirmity so that he could steal his brother's blessing. He broke an ancient custom so that he could marry the younger daughter before her older sister was wed. He deceives his father-in-law so that he can get every single sheep he feels he has earned. He clung, he clung to an angel that was begging to be released wanting to get a blessing from it first. Like Hamilton, in pursuing his sense of destiny, Jacob sacrifices relationships, family ties, and his reputation on the altar of his success and his legacy. But both of these characters have a sudden shift, a sudden shift that's prompted by the same event. Upon the road, to greatness, both lose a child, or at least both think that they do. And this is the turning point that allows them to recognize that there is something more important than greatness, legacy, destiny, success, and that's relationships with those we love. That nothing can sustain us or satisfy us as much as deep connections to others. After losing his son, Alexander Hamilton finally takes that refrain that his wife had sung to him over and over again, and now he sings it to her as a sort of pathetic and powerful plea. He cries to her, look at where we are. Look at where we started. I know that there's no replacing what we lost, and you need time, but I'm not afraid. I know who I married. Just let me stay here by your side. That would be enough. In a startling turn, the man who could never be satisfied realizes 
that he could have had satisfaction all along, that he had enough, and he could find that again if he can repair the broken relationships. And Jacob has this very same realization this week in our Torah portion. He learns, though, that his son Joseph is, in fact, still alive. And Joseph is sending back to his brothers and to his father riches and chariots. And all of Joseph's brothers, Jacob's sons, are gawking at these symbols of power. And Jacob finally says to them, Rav, which our commentators tell us can be translated as, it's enough. The rest of this, Joseph's position, his status, none of that matters. What matters is that my son is still alive, that my family can be together again, that we can be at each other's sides. Rav, he says, that would be enough. And the truth is that few of us are Jacob or Hamilton, though many of us likely think our lives would be great source material for Broadway. But I think also, especially as New Yorkers, many of us feel a drive to succeed, to make the most of every moment, to not throw away our shot. And I think, in fact, not just as New Yorkers, but simply because we're human. There lies in our hearts a modicum of a desire to live beyond our lifespan, to find our corner of the sky where the sun, the moon, and the stars might all bow to us. Our fire that drives us might not be as grand or lofty in scope as with Jacob or with Hamilton, but each of us at some point is driven by a feeling that we have some great purpose to pursue, a destiny to fulfill, and that this can push us to do great and awesome things, but it can also force us to make great and awesome sacrifices. It can twist us until we lose sight of that eternal truth, that without being bound to others by love, no success and no achievement, no life is truly full. We can take and take and take, never feeling like it's enough, but just as surely as we will rise, we will also certainly fall. And whether we're ascending or tumbling, the only constant is that if we're surrounding by loving community, that will be enough, enough to weather life's highs and lows, enough to add joy to our days, enough to ground our all too short time with deep meaning and purpose. And so luckily, this great realization need not be spurred by dramatic loss that puts everything in perspective. We're luckier in some senses than Jacob and Hamilton. We could, each and every day, say to ourselves, look at where we are, look at where we started. The fact that we're alive is a miracle. Let us be at someone's side. That would be enough.